out there, and happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. My name is Hawken Carlton. I am the proprietor of Carlton Carnivores, a little home business that I run, working with carnivorous plants as well as a few other interesting uh, plants and animals out there. Uh, the topic I'd like to bring to you guys today is one of rather special importance when you are either growing carnivorous plants or looking for them in the wild, and also a topic that often brings up quite a bit of uh, contention. Uh, among hobbyists, among uh, researchers, all the same. And that is making sure you know what it is that you are actually dealing with. With nearly 800 different species of carnivorous plants described around the world, there's a lot of diversity around there, but a lot of them can sometimes look really similar to each other. Uh, this comes up a lot when we are dealing with things like the Alata complex in the tropical pitcher plants, Nepenthes, a uh, number of species from the Philippines that look very similar to each other and have had a lot of mislabeling issues in the past. Uh, if you work with, say, sundews, those little uh, sticky-leaved carnivorous plants, there's a number of groups that also have very similar-looking species that are often confused with each other. And we find a lot of mislabeling issues, uh, both uh, sometimes purposefully, more often accidentally in uh, cultivation when we're working with different groups. So I want to talk about kind of how you can go about making sure you know what it is that you are growing or what you are looking at in the wild and making sure that you have the right labels um, when you are talking about plants to other people or when you are selling them, trading them, and so on. So I'll start with... Um, perhaps the most widely uh, grown group, the sundews. And the biggest confusion in these guys is probably when you are dealing with the Drosera spatulata group. Uh, that is the species Drosera spatulata, uh, some of its relatives like Tocaiensis, Oblanceolata, and a few others. And sometimes uh, confused with species that are found in other parts of the world, such as Capillaris is commonly uh, mixed up with this group. So if we look here, all right, I have one example, and I'll put up some photos to show you a little better. Uh, this is Drosera spatulata. This is a form from the Royal National Park in Sydney, Australia. This is a relatively small uh, sundew species. Uh, most forms only grow one to two inches across, and the name spatulata means spoon-leafed, and that's kind of what the shape of the leaves on these guys looks like. Uh, they have these kind of tapered little petioles, the bottom section of the leaf that comes out to a wider part, uh, the lamina that's actually covered in the tentacles. Now, most forms of spatulata are fairly similar. They have kind of a gradual taper from the bottom of the leaf, the petiole, out to the tip. Now, there are a few varieties that are a little more confusing. Uh, you have the species, or the forms, that should possibly be their own species, from New Zealand. This one is from the Ahipara gum fields in northern New Zealand. Again, I'll put up a couple photos. Uh, this and some of the other forms from New Zealand have a very different look where they have this long skinny petiole and then a broader kind of rounded lamina right at the tip. Looks very different from the other spatulata forms. Or you may have forms from, say, uh, the Macau area near China, Hong Kong, uh, forms of spatulata from there have kind of a chunkier, more thick set appearance where they have really thick but short petioles and then that broad lamina again. And that is the form that is often confused with uh, species such as Tocaiensis, which originated as once a hybrid between spatulata and rotundifolia, the round leaf sundew, but has become its own uh, lineage by going through a process called polyploidy where the genes actually duplicated and allowed the plant to become uh, fertile again after stemming from a sterile hybrid. So the sterile hybrid tocaiensis, uh, which is currently called form uh, hyugaensis, is also found in cultivation. These will produce flowers and seeds, uh, or they'll produce flowers, but they won't produce seeds. Then you have tocaiensis, variety tocaiensis, which is the actual species and the fertile form which produces flowers, produces seeds, and will reproduce itself. These guys are sometimes confused with relatives like Drosera oblanceolata from the Hong Kong and southern China region, 
or other species, as I mentioned, like Capillaris. This is a form from southern Florida. I also grow a few forms from uh, Brazil, Cuba, and other parts of the U.S. All of these are small, rosetted sundews with thin petioles and broader lamina in some form, and there's a lot of other species that might be confused in this mix as well. Natalensis and um, Venusta sometimes from South Africa will get mixed up in this group. So uh, how do you tell what it is that you're actually growing? Where do you go? So um, there are a number of good resources that you can find online. Uh, from the International Carnivorous Plant Society itself. Uh, they have a number of links on there. There are grow guides for different species with lots of photos of different forms. They have photos with the spatulata complex, uh, the northern temperate species with things like capillaris and such. And you can go on there, you can look up how to grow these different things, and you can also find photos um, that kind of show what these plants look like. Now, if you don't find the information that you need there, the best source, if you're able to, uh, if you're able to take the time to get through the kind of dull reading that it is, is go to the actual original descriptions of the species. So the research articles that actually described uh, what these species are supposed to look like. They will have information on the holotype, which is the original collection of a species, which is usually put into an herbarium somewhere for safekeeping. And it will describe all the little minute details that talk about what uh, the plant should look like. And you can take those details and compare them to the plant that you have to figure out what it is, if it's actually what uh, the label says it is. Now, with a lot of these plants, those details are going to be very minute things. So if you're looking in the spatulata complex trying to figure out if you're growing spatulata or tocaiensis, you're going to be looking at details like exactly how does the pedial transition to the lamina, and then uh, what is the structure of the stipules, which are these little tiny papery structures that sit right at the base of the leaves. And so do, the, do those stipules have a lot of little filiform ends that come off of them, or does it, is it just like one chunky triangle in shape? And then you also have to look at uh, the flower stalk and structure. So are, is the flower stalk uh, very thin? Is it covered in glands or does it have no structures at all on it as you go up to the flowers? How many flowers is it actually producing at a time? And what is the shape of the uh, sepals? Those are the little green structures that actually hold together the uh, petals as the flower bud is forming. What is the shape of those? Are the sepals kind of rounded at the end so they come to this sharp tip? And then once the flower opens out, what is the shape? What is the color of the petals? Um, what is the structure of the actual um, reproductive organs within, the anthers, the stigmas, and so on? It's all these little details that you have to look at to make sure uh, to tell the difference between different species. Because with, say, tocaiensis and spatulata, since tocaiensis came from a hybrid that originated from spatulata, they are very, very similar, and a lot of those structures look very, very close to each other. So they are very small details. So spatulata, does these, uh, do the stipules have like 8 to 11 little filiform tips on them, or in tocaiensis, do they have fewer, for example? Or is the shape of the sepals uh, more pointed or a little more rounded? Because tocaiensis will have a little bit more rounded sepals, most spatulata forms will have more pointed sepals. It's little tiny details like this that are used to tell the difference. Uh, in other groups, such as the Nepenthes alata complex, uh, there's a huge amount of confusion with, in particular, this one hybrid that is really common in cultivation, really easy to grow. It's called Nepenthes ex ventrata. This is a plant that produces very slender, kind of reddish or bicolored pitchers, uh, and it's really easy to grow. So it's found everywhere, but once upon a time, it was frequently mislabeled, partly due to the actions of one old nursery as Nepenthes alata instead. And so it is often sold under that label still. The biggest issue there is Nepenthes ventrata doesn't even have Nepenthes alata in its parentage. It's actually a hybrid with another species in that complex, Gracilla flora, crossed with ventricosa. 
So, the uh, actual species Alata is really uncommon in cultivation, and um, very few people actually grow it or grow it successfully. And so most of what people grow is actually Nepenthes ventrata or Nepenthes graciliflora, the actual ventrata parent. And so some of the details that you have to look at with those guys is uh, the actual shape of the pitchers. Does it have this really bulbous uh, bottom base with a narrow top? Or is it more ventricose in shape or hourglass in shape? What are the actual colors? Do the pitchers have wings when they are young or not? Because Nepenthes alata, alata actually means winged. So the lower pitchers and the upper pitchers on that species both have wings that run down the front of the pitcher. Nepenthes ventrata does not have wings at almost any stage at all, thanks to its ventricosa uh, parentage. And Nepenthes graciliflora also tends to lose those wings as it goes to upper pitchers. Now, there's a bit more confusion, though, with Graciliflora and Alata. They're very similar. They were once lumped as the same species until being uh, split a few years ago. Uh, and sometimes that winged trait is not always reliable or the shape of the pitchers. So even more minute details you have to look at. Um, Alata also is a kind of hairy plant. The pitchers and oftentimes the leaves are covered with this very fuzzy, velvety layer of hairs that Graciliflora generally doesn't have. It also tends to have a more distinct petiole at the base of the actual leaf uh, compared to uh, Graciliflora, which has more of kind of an open winged structure, so the leaf kind of blends down right into the stem. Now, where you can find information like this, um, you always want to go back to original sources if you can, so the actual descriptions of the species. So the original description of the species. So you want to, uh, if you can, access research articles, but a lot of those articles sometimes are behind paywalls. If you can contact the authors, then you can get those papers and you can read through and find information. Otherwise, uh, there are other sources that you can use that will often have the information on how to tell different species apart uh, kind of simplified down a little bit, and that is any number of uh, books that are out there. So a good source is a number of the Redfern uh, publishers series. So one of their most recent books is the New Nepenthes. This is volume two. This actually has the description in here of uh, Nepenthes alata as it is now known along with some of the new species that have been split off from it. So this is uh, rel somewhat simplified down from the original research articles but has all that information. Uh, for other groups, you may access, say, if you're trying to tell the difference between different varieties of, say, American pitcher plants, you might go for uh, Saraceniaceae of North America. All right, these are big books. Sometimes they can be expensive, but perhaps you can find them at a library. Uh, or you might know somebody who might be willing to lend you a copy for a little while or take photo of, photos of a particular page if you need them. Or Drosera. There are actually a couple different sources that are really good. Again, a lot of these are published by Redfern, so you have Drosera of the World. I also have the uh, Carnivorous Plants of Australia, Magnum Opus by Alan Lowry. These are the kinds of sources that I go to for making sure I know what it is that I'm dealing with. And that's the first step. <coughs> the second step is simply practice. So. Um, growing out these plants and growing different varieties or talking with people who do grow different varieties and getting yourself familiar with each of these different forms. When you start out it's not going to be quick and easy. You're not going to be able to tell things at a glance at all. So that's when you go to the books to try and figure out what it is that you're working with. So if you're dealing with the Drosera spatulata group or any of the other little rosetted sundews, uh, go to the Drosser of the World books or the Carnivorous Plants of Australia. Or talk with people who are uh, really familiar with those particular groups. So uh, some people who I might suggest, you have, uh, well, Alan Lowry, unfortunately, is now passed, but there are a number of people who have become sort of his protégés. So there's uh, Greg Burke, uh, Mitch Behrman is very familiar with some of the stuff from New Zealand in particular. Uh, Thilo Kruger 
is another person for familiar with a lot of Australian stuff. Uh, for South African things, you might try to contact Alex Dietrich or uh, Noah Juve, who are both becoming very familiar with stuff. Uh, Dietrich works with plants in C2, so he sees all these things uh, in person. So he's a very good source for learning different species from South Africa, trying to figure out if you happen to have, say, Drosera natalensis versus Drosera dilsiana, which is another huge uh, contentious topic. Uh, two species that are very closely related to each other and have frequently been mislabeled as each other. So, or if you're dealing with species, say, from North America, you might look into writings or contact directly. Uh, Barry Rice is another good person who has a lot of information. So, these are the kinds of resources that uh, you go to first. So, the books, the research articles, uh, that are going to tell you all the details about the species, where they grow, what they should look like, the particular traits that are unique to that species and that species only. You can use that to try and look at your plants and figure out, are you growing what the label says, or has it been mislabeled somewhere in cultivation? As you get more familiar with these species, you will start to figure out um, there are just certain certain gestalt looks that some of these plants have that you start to recognize at a glance. Uh, if you find me online, you'll notice oftentimes I'm piping up when uh, somebody's growing something labeled as spatulata and it's a, turned out to be Drosera tocaiensis, or the Nepenthes ventrata gracilliflora alata issue. Uh, these are things where you once you become really familiar with certain species or certain hybrids and so on, you can recognize them even through a photo at a glance knowing uh, that's that particular plant. So you go to the people who know the most, then as time goes on you become familiar with them in your own collection and looking through photos. And so you become more proficient at recognizing certain things and certain details that you really need to pick up on over time. And eventually you can get to the point where most things will be recognizable at a glance. And so you can know, have you just brought in a plant that is mislabeled, or do you have something that is true to what the label says and what it should be? And you can make sure that you keep growing out pure lineages and making sure you have things labeled correctly. Even if they came in wrong from somewhere else, you can uh, edit that and make sure that whenever you pass those plants on to someone else, they are going to get the correct label in the future and we can make sure that uh, the number of mislabeled editing issues is reduced as time goes on. So, uh, certainly again, for more information on figuring out different plants, uh, contact some of those people, so Dietrich, Burke, Rice, and so on, and visit some of the websites that they've set up or help to set up. So again, the International Carnivorous Plant Society website has a huge amount of information on all these different plants, how to grow them, what they will like best, and since some of these guys may look similar but grow in very different areas, knowing exactly what you have will also make sure you can make uh, grow those plants to the best of your ability in the best conditions possible so that they will look their most prime. So some of those websites, uh, visit them, find uh, all that information as well as more grow uh, tips for different species. As you get more familiar with some of these common ones, you can start to work on some of the more uh, uncommon things and figure out uh, the species or the forms, the localities that really don't show up in cultivation a lot. If you happen to see a label, you'll be able to tell better, is that actually the rare form that it says it is or has somebody purposefully or accidentally mislabeled it somewhere? you can make sure you're getting the right plant as well before you ever actually put your money towards it. So that's about all that I have for you guys today. If you have more questions, you can always feel free to reach out and contact me at carltoncarnivores.com or through my uh, Patreon accounts, patreon.com slash hcarlton. You can find me on uh, Facebook in a number of the carnivorous plant groups or my own social media pages, Carlton Carnivores, on basically all websites. But until next time, Happy World Carnivorous Plants Day, and this is Carlton Carnivores.
it's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society, or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.